Good morning, Woodland. It is good to be with you this morning. My name is Pastor Ken Gilmore. I'm the interim teaching pastor here at Woodland. And what we're doing is, is we're doing just a two-part series. This is part two of that series where we're, we're, we're stopping, we're calling a time out as we enter into a new year of ministry and a new season of ministry to talk about why we're here, to talk about the purpose in, in, in why we gather what we're here to do, because we have a mission. Jesus has given us a mission. And if you are here this morning and you call Woodland Church your church home, this is the mission, as Woodland phrases it, as we phrase it, that you can, that you can say, all right, this is why we're here. We exist to gather, grow, and go to see Jesus transform lives. That is why we're here. It's the mission that we are on as an organization, as a church, as this body of believers. Because we're not simply here just because it's Sunday. We don't gather just because it's Sunday. Now, gathering is important. At Woodland, we gather in rows. On Sundays, we, we gather in circles throughout the week. That's what all the small group talk is about. Because here's the thing, we know that gathering is important. It is important to gather as believers, but the purpose in gathering is to grow more and more like Christ. And growing requires connection. You grow best when you are connected with like-minded people moving in the same direction. And so we don't talk about groups just because we, don't, we figure you have hours of availability just sitting every week. We promote it because it's important because it's part of why we exist, is to gather and to grow. It's the mission that we have. It's, it's what we're here to do, so that we aren't just attending church, that we don't just go to church, but that we are the church, that we become who Christ has called us to be. There's another part of our mission statement, because it isn't just about gathering and growing as great as those things are. There's also a really critical part of our mission statement that talks about we need to go. And so for the past, for the past two weeks, this week and, and last week, we are looking at how we go as a church. What does it mean? I think we have a pretty good understanding that gathering means getting together and growing becomes more like Christ and growing in our knowledge of the scriptures. What does going mean? When we use it in our mission statement, what does it mean? Well, what we're doing is this, we're talking about the way we go. Last week, we talked about the quality of our going. What, what is to be a defining characteristic in the way that we go? And what we're trying to do here at Woodland is, is we're trying to do two things. We are trying to fulfill the great commission that God's given us, but doing so in the spirit of the great commandment. Because Jesus was asked, what's the most important thing? And Jesus gave two answers, love God and love others. That's the quality of our going. That's the character of who we are. We are people who are defined by our love for God and our love for our neighbor. And here's the thing, love isn't a feeling, it's a choice to see someone else as valuable. That's what love is. Love isn't just merely a feeling that we have, we don't just have love, it is an activity. It is a choice that we make to see someone else as valuable. Jesus defined love for us. In, in John chapter 13, when he was with his disciples, he said this, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. There's an if in there. There's, there's a question mark. Are we gonna be people who actually Answer that if by loving each other and loving those around us. You see, because here's the thing. The kind of love that Jesus talked about isn't just a feeling sort of love. In our culture, we embrace the feeling sort of love, but Jesus is like, no, it's an active love. It's compassion in action. It is affection with an effect. That there's an end result to this love, not just feeling love towards someone, but actually making a difference. So last week we ended the message with three questions. I challenge you to answer three questions. And, and I hope that these, 
I hope it isn't today that you're like, oh yeah, that's right, he asked us three questions. I hope these are questions that have stuck with you. I hope there's something that you take into every day and every week of your life. The question that asks, who do I need to choose to value? Because I don't value them just by how I feel, I have to choose it. The other question, who needs something I have? How can I be, how can I actually put love on display? And then who do I need to love as Christ loved me? Who do I need to love in the ways that Christ has loved me? Because if, if I call him Lord, if I'm his disciple, then I am called to love. Now, what's fascinating is, is all those questions are who questions. Because yeah, for, for some of us, we, we get confused and we think Christianity is about a what? A set of beliefs, a book that we read, but it centers on who. Who we love and who we serve are as, as, as important as what we know. And so today I wanna talk about the second aspect of going. Because the first aspect is, is we need to be people who are identified as loving people. We need, to be, we need to be characterized by love. But there's more in our going than simply going out in the world and loving people the way Jesus loved people. That's great. But that's not the end of it. Because Jesus gave us a mission. And yeah, we have it worded a certain way here at Woodland, but the mission is something that Jesus made clear three different times in the New Testament. You find it in Matthew chapter 28. You find it in Mark chapter 16, and you find it in Acts chapter one. Anytime you find something three times in the Bible, pay attention. <laughs> There's a re that's intentional, it's there for a reason. And the first one comes in Matthew chapter 28, just before Jesus ascends into heaven, he tells his disciples, all authority in heaven and on earth have been given to me, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. In Mark chapter 16, verse 15, it says, he, Jesus, said to them, go, into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. And in Acts chapter one, when Jesus is meeting with his disciples in Jerusalem and he tells them, stay in Jerusalem until my father sends the gift of the Holy Spirit. He says these words in, in verse eight, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now in the first two mission statements, Jesus tells us to go. Go is a quality that Jesus says, all right, this is what you're to do. You are to go. The third one doesn't say go, but it implies it. Because it says, you're gonna be my witnesses. Where? In Jerusalem, where you are right now, but also in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. This is going to be a movement that actually moves. It's gonna go somewhere, and I want you to take it there. That is the mission. The mission is go. Yes, we're to love people, but we're also to do something else. You see, our goal is not to simply love people. It's, we love people like Jesus, but we're to lead people as well. That, that's part of our calling. It's part of what going looks like. To lead, the definition of lead is to go before or with, to show the way, to conduct or escort. There's a great example of this. Anybody ever own a Rubik's Cube? Any, any child of the 80s out there, all right? You own, you own a Rubik's Cube, all right? The Rubik's Cube was invented in 1974 and it wasn't distributed globally until 1980. And I'll never forget it because they started showing up in school. And all of a sudden they had these weird little puzzles that showed up and I was just like fascinated by them. Because they were so cool. Never seen anything like it. And, 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 and you know, they'd hand it to you and you'd mess it up and then you'd be like, oh no, how, how, do, I get this, how do I get this back together? 
And, and I remember, you know, playing with a Rubik's Cube. My mom and dad got me one. Now, you need to understand something about a Rubik's Cube. Um, there were brand name Rubik's Cubes and then off-brand. And I was one of six kids in my household, so we often got the off-brand. So I think mine was white with fluorescent stickers. I don't quite know what was going on there, but it worked like a Rubik's Cube. And here's the thing. I messed that one up and I couldn't fix it. I, I tried and I couldn't get it. I could get one side solved. And so that's the side that faced out on my shelf. <laughs> but I couldn't solve the Rubik's Cube. And, and so my first solution was, okay, I, I, I know how I'm gonna solve this. I'm just gonna peel the stickers off. And I put them back on in the right order and that worked great the first time. Then the stickers started falling off. Then I had a really janky looking cube and it was just like, oh no, that doesn't work, all right? And so I remember going to a friend and uh, this guy was a brainiac in our school and he was a guy who actually could solve the Rubik's cube. I can tell you what, in school, those guys were impressive because we were really deficient in our entertainment in the 80s, all right? So it's like, oh, he can solve the cube. Wow, that's amazing. And I remember going up to him and I say, how do you do that? And you know what he did? He recommended a book to me. He said, there's actually a book that I read that helped me solve the Rubik's Cube. <laughs> there were multiple books that were released on helping you solve the Rubik's Cube. Here's the thing. In school, I didn't read the books I was assigned to read. I wasn't about to go and buy a book on how to solve a Rubik's Cube. That just wasn't going to be happening. So I'm just like, thank you for that, no value. All right, and so I finally got my hands on a real Rubik's Cube that was my very own. And unfortunately with the real Rubik's Cube, there are no stickers. I mean, it's just kind of embedded in there. You can't peel them off. And so I was like, how am I gonna solve this? Because I messed it up, can't solve it. So this was my second solution to, to fixing the cube. It was just breaking it. <laughs> Because I, I discovered you could break it apart and reassemble it. And you could do that a couple of times, but after a couple of times, then it got real loose and pieces would start to fall off and you had yet again a Rubik's Cube that doesn't work right. And so the 80s went by and I left the Rubik's Cube in my past. Never solved that puzzle. Well, then Diane and I subscribed to a date in a box subscription. We, yesterday, we got uh, at the XO conference here, the marriage conference, we got these awesome boxes full of date night things. And, and getting it just reminded me of the box that Diane and I would get, you know, and they were always themed. These boxes were themed. So whoever put these together, thank you very much for your generosity towards us. And if you ever get a chance to go to a conference here at Woodland, I would encourage you to do it. It is a great way to make connections. But here's the thing, we got this date night in a box and its theme was back to the 80s. And of course you open it up and everything's fluorescent, you know, and it's all, it's all the stuff that we remembered. And inside that box was a little keychain size Rubik's Cube. And I went, ah, my nemesis. It has returned in bright colors. And I picked it up and I was looking at it and I was playing with it and what happened? Can anybody guess? I messed it up. And I looked at it and I went, oh no, I messed it up. I can't, there's no way I can solve this. I, I'm not buying a book and now I got one I can't solve. It's so frustrating. So you know what I did? Because we have a tool we didn't have in the 80s now called YouTube. <laughs> and I searched on YouTube how to solve a Rubik's Cube and this site came up. And what I did is I watched this guy and he walked you through the different ways that you needed to turn it, the different formulas you would use to solve a Rubik's Cube. And I solved it. <laughs> I love church because in no other environment would you clap about that. But thank you. I love your mercy and grace towards me. But that's the thing. I solved the cube. I was so excited. I messed it up again and I solved it again. I got so geeky about it the next Sunday. I actually showed a video in church of me solving the Rubik's Cube. All right. That's how desperate for the applause I was. But I was like, oh, Decades of waiting and I finally had it. How? Not because someone handed me a book. I didn't get a pamphlet. I didn't get a business card with an invitation to a Rubik's Cube conference. I had someone show me. A person led me through and it made all the difference because I could follow him. I could track what he was doing. He was leading me somewhere because the goal for both of us was a solved cube. So I knew I could follow him to that solution. 
Do you know there's a world who desperately wants to be reconciled to their heavenly father? They just don't have anybody to lead them. And they can be given a book and they can be given a pamphlet, but what they need is someone to step in and show them the way, to lead them. We exist as a church to gather, to grow, to go, to see Jesus transform lives. See, the thing is, is when we go out into the world and we love them, yes, we are loving them like Jesus, but we need to do more. We love people like Jesus and we lead people to Jesus. Because our mission isn't for us to go out and transform lives, we can't. What we can do is take Jesus to people, help people see Jesus, point them to Jesus so that he can do the transforming. We have a mission and we need to be on it if we call this church our church home. Because here's the deal, Jesus pointed to himself when he was on this earth. Yes, he he talked about coming back into the kingdom of God and God's kingdom spreading on this planet. But the way Jesus talked about the kingdom, he said, if you want a reference point, look at me. Love one another as I have loved you. In John chapter 14, he was talking about going away. He he was telling his disciples, listen, I'm going away. I'm getting ready to leave. And and of course, they were freaked out about this. And he would say to them in John chapter 14, verse one, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Jesus points to himself. And and if we're gonna be people who go out into this world to love the world, we're also to lead them to Jesus. We are to point them to Jesus, which is a bold thing. Because here's the thing, Jesus pointed to himself. There are some skeptics who are like, Jesus never claimed to be God. Really, have you read John chapter 14? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Go through the scriptures. Jesus forgave sins. That's something only God's supposed to do. Mark chapter two. Jesus calls himself the son of man in Mark chapter 14. The very term son of of man comes out of the book of Daniel chapter seven in a scene describing, I saw one who looked like the son of man. And it's a description of God. Jesus claimed to be life. Not just, not just a person who knew about life, life itself. In John 11 and 14, Jesus claimed he preexisted in John 6 and 17. And Jesus claimed supreme authority. Matthew 28, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Not just authority on earth, all authority in heaven and on earth. Now we are either dealing with a super delusional guy or someone who is nothing but a deceiver to make these claims if they aren't true, or we are dealing with deity. The way that C.S. Lewis talked about it was, he's either a liar, a lunatic, or he's Lord. And if you have placed your trust in Jesus, he is your Lord. And as your Lord, there is a command he has asked you to follow. 
Matthew chapter 28. There are other places, but I wanna unpack Matthew chapter 28, what we call the Great Commission, where Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. This is not a mission that he gave just to the people in front of him, because if you haven't noticed yet, the age hasn't ended. And Jesus says, I'll be with you to the end of the age. That means his mission's still ongoing through us who are his disciples. Now, as you look at that passage, one of the things that you will notice is that there are some verbs that we're supposed to do. I've pulled them out of the passage so that you could see them. We are to go, make disciples, baptizing them, teaching them, and to obey all Christ's commands. Because he says, teach them to obey every command I have given you. A lot of us Christians get that a little bit wrong. We forget that we're actually under the command to obey before we go and teach anybody else. But here's the thing. These are things Jesus says. Now, Greek is an interesting language because Greek has a way of putting a particular emphasis on a word, a verb, to make it an imperative verb, a commanding verb. There are definitely descriptive verbs. If I say, I'm going out for a run, okay? Okay, run is a verb, it's a descriptive. I'm running. All right, if I say the building's on fire, run. That's a commanding verb, right? That's an action, that's something I have to do. That's telling me to do something. When you look at the verbs that are in this passage, go, make disciples, baptizing them, teaching them, obey. Which one do you think is the imperative verb? Which one is the imperative verb? How many of you would say go is the imperative? That's what Jesus is commanding us to do, all right? How many of you would say make disciples? That's the commanding verb. How many would say baptizing them? That's the command that Jesus gave. How many of you would say teaching them and how many of you would say obey? All right, yeah, all of those are important. Here's the thing, just so you know, um, none of them are the imperative. Because number two on the list is make disciples. Here's the thing, the original language does not have make disciples. Make disciples is an English way of translating it to help us understand what it's trying to say. Because in the original language, it just simply says disciple. But for us, disciple is a noun. Look it up, look it up in the dictionary. It will be a noun. But to Jesus, it was a verb. If you wanna know what it would say, if you stripped away the make disciples, it would simply say, going out, make disciples of all nations. I'm sorry, it doesn't say make. Going out, disciple all nations. Going out as you go, that's not the command, it's assumed, you're gonna go. As you go, disciple all nations. Because here's the thing, it's an imperative. It's something we are to do. And the problem is, is we look at that and say, well, what does that mean? I mean, in English, we don't even have it as a verb. So how are we supposed to do it? Well, let me illustrate it this way. Any of you parents ever ask your kids to clean their rooms? You ever tell them, clean your room? Right? Very often when, 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 the, when our boys were little, Diane would have to go to work. She'd be like, hey, can you make sure the boys clean their rooms today? I'd be like, okay, I'm on it. All right, and I would say to the boys, all right, boys, clean your rooms. Go and clean, imperative. And five minutes later, they're walking out of the rooms. All done, dad. And I'd be like, that was really fast. Because their definition of clean was hide the stuff. Push it under the bed, put it in the closet, just put it away, get it out of sight, and then the room's clean. And then I would have to qualify the term clean to them. And I would ask them the question when they came out super fast. Is it mom clean? To which they would be like, no. 
because they understood mom clean because they had watched mom clean. They knew what clean was. Clean was picking up. Clean was dusting. Clean was vacuuming. Clean was taking out the trash. Clean was putting your clothes in the right drawer in the right way. Clean had a definition because there was a person they watched clean. Well, here's the thing. The disciples watched Jesus' disciple. So they knew what it looked like. They knew what Jesus meant when he said disciple. They understood that as disciples, they go. Look at the ministry of Jesus. He was on the move. It was a movement that actually moved. That he baptized. They knew that being a disciple was teaching and even more importantly, obeying. That's what it meant to be a disciple. The church, if you want to boil it down, the church exists to disciple disciples who disciple. Do you get that? That's why we're here. To disciple disciples who disciple. Because here's the thing, none of us can make a disciple. That, that's one of the reasons I really don't care for our English translation of it. Because you have no ability to make a disciple. I have no ability to make a disciple. I'm still trying to make this disciple. How do you think I'm gonna make you a disciple? Because that's not my job. Jesus is the one who makes disciples. We are called to disciple. To follow him and lead others in following him as well. You see, when it came down to it, Jesus, Jesus wasn't looking for, you know, for a, a mission for this church. He, he was looking for a church that could complete his mission. He, he wanted a church, a group of people who would actually be on his mission in the world because his mission didn't stop when he ascended to heaven. His mission was transferred to us to carry out in the world. If we call him Lord, we have something to do. And we need to be people who are on mission. The apostle Paul would put it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter five. For Christ's love compels us, always. Christ's love is what compels us. It's the quality of our going. But there's a purpose in our going. Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That we are a people who have been reconciled we have been made right with our heavenly father and we live in a world full of people who would love to be reconciled with their heavenly father. Are we the people who are going to lead them? Are we the people who are going into this world to love them well and lead them to Jesus? Because that is our mission. If we understand what Christ has done for us, it will shift what we do in our world. I love the way J.D. Greer put it in his book, Gaining by Losing, where he writes, we don't become better disciples by mastering 10 steps to becoming more like Jesus. We become passionate followers of God when our hearts are gripped with awe and wonder at the 10 billion steps he took toward us 
when he came to rescue us in Christ. When we see how much God has loved us, to have taken those 10 billion steps to invite us into a relationship with him, it changes the way we go out into our world where people are desperate to know. What does it mean to have a heavenly father that I can know, that I can love, that I can trust? Because here's the thing. If we aren't on mission, if we as individual believers in Christ are not on this mission, the church isn't on its mission. We are not doing what we're here to do. So I wanna challenge you because here's the thing. Making disciples is a me thing as well as a we thing. It, it, it actually includes all of us. Every single person who calls Jesus Lord has a mission that he's given them to live out in our world. And here's the thing, I know for some of us, we're just like, well, yeah, but Pastor Ken, isn't that your job? I mean, you're the preacher. I mean, the Great Commission says, well, one of the commissions says, go and preach to all creation. Well, isn't that the job of the preacher? Hold on a second. Preach is also can be translated proclaim. And the preacher isn't the only one who proclaims Christ. We are all called to go out into our world, love them well, and lead them to Jesus. Point them to Jesus. So I have two questions I wanna challenge you with at the end of today's message. Because if you call Woodland Church your church home, even more, if you call Jesus your Lord, you are called to be on mission in our world. So here's the first question. Who am I leading? Who am I leading? I want you to ask yourself that question. Who am I leading? Who am I out in this world and I'm loving them and I'm leading them? Who is it? Because here's the thing. If you don't have someone you're leading, you are not on mission. That, that doesn't feel comfortable, does it? Because for some of us, we're like, well, I, I don't know really who, who I would identify. Be careful. You're not on the mission Jesus gave if you're not going, if you're not loving and leading. And we need to be people on mission. And, and I know, I can hear it. I can already hear that. Well, Ken, yeah, but I'm, I'm an introvert. Well, oh, you're right. When Jesus said, all authority in heaven on earth has been given to me, therefore, extroverts, go into the world. <laughs> it's not what he says. Therefore, go without a qualification. It might change how you go into the world. It doesn't change that you should. It may change how you lead somebody, but it's not gonna alter the fact that you are called to lead to love and lead people is what we're called to do. And, and it can be as simple as having a conversation with somebody and bringing up the fact that you were at church on Sunday, bringing up Jesus in some way. You know, I was reading my Bible the other day and you might think, well, that's, that's, that just, that, that sounds silly. No, that makes a difference. It means that in your life, there's this category a relationship with God that you have that a person who doesn't wants to know more about. You don't have to be a street preacher, but you can find daily ways to proclaim who Jesus is and that you were invited into a relationship with God that everyone needs because Jesus said, no one comes to the Father except through me. So the first question is, who are you leading? And if you're like, oof, I don't, I don't know that I have anybody I could identify, then I wanna ask you a follow-up question, and this is for everybody. Who are your three? Because here's what I wanna challenge you to do. I want you to, to leave this place, and I want you to be praying, all right, God, who are three people that are in my life that I come into contact with that you want me to love and lead? Who, who, are, who are gonna be my three? I wanna warn you, when you pray this way, God's listening. 
Because here's the secret, he loves those three more than you do. And as a matter of fact, for some of you, as soon as I say, who are your three? Your first response was, dear God, not my neighbor. Dear Lord, please not my neighbor. And God might be like, oh, by the way, your neighbor. Or it might be, Lord, not that person at work. Lord, Lord, not this person that I encounter at school. Just anybody but them. And God's like, know them. Love and lead them. And when you pray, when you begin to pray, when you talk to God about people before you talk to people about God, it makes a difference. The last time I gave this challenge, a woman in our church came up to me and she said about a month later, because I gave it for kind of a month time frame, pray for them, pray for them every day, pray for them three times a day. And here's the thing. She came to me and she's just like, you know, you asked me to pray for three. Every single person I was praying for has engaged me in a conversation about faith in the past month. So much so, I need a new three. Because God wants us on mission. And here's the deal. There are people praying for their loved ones but they don't have that interconnect. They don't have that connectivity. They're praying. Who knows that God hasn't put you in those spots for those people to answer their prayers. You just have to be on mission. Who are you leading? Who are your three? I tell you, if we simply do this and get intentional about it, God's mission gets done and here's the promise this is what I love about it you will never do God's mission alone because Jesus said at the end of the great commission I will be with you always so you may engage with somebody but Jesus is engaging them right along with you who are you leading who are your three. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you. For, for many of us in this room, there was someone who took going seriously. And because they were willing to love and lead, we now have a relationship with you. And Lord, is it, it's exciting and it is wonderful to be connected to you, our, to be connected to our heavenly father because of what you've done. And sometimes we can be so excited about what we've received, we fail to take that out into the world, to be the person who loves and leads someone else. Lord, if we are part of this church, if we call you Lord, we have a mission and we need to be on it. So help us to know who we're leading. Help us to identify the one Help us to pray for three. Give us wisdom to know what we need to do with what we've heard. Give us the courage to do something about it. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.